Good morning, church. Today, Pastor Peter Chin will be preaching from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. My name is Lighton, and I'll read in Luganda, and Jerry will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. Nebante Gezanti, Abawangangusiwa, Abadayo Musaza, Bari Mukabi Kanene, Munaku Ninji, Bugwea Yerusalemi, Yamenewa, Era, Wankachuayo, Nayo Chevo Murilo. When Nauri de Bigambevio, Nentula Wansi Nen Kava, Nemare Bidonga, Munakuwa de Gansiva, Eranga and Saba, Masoga Katonda Weguru. Nenjo Geranti, I Mukama Katonda Weguru, Katondo Mukuru. Owenti isa, akume ndagano ye, era ayagala avo, abagondela amate kage. They said to me, those who survive the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Ozibule amaso go, otege okutu, okuri okusaba kwa muduo, kwensaba maso go, emisana nechiro, kuruava dubo, abantu ba isilaidi, njatu levi vivye, bietu akora, fe aba isilaidi. Ganange, ne nyumba ya chitange mweturi. Tua sobya, mumasogo. Ne tuta govele la mateka ago, ne vila girovyo, bie watuma omuduo musa. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you, day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you have given your servant Moses. Jukira, ebira giro biwawa omudu o Musa, ngoyo geranti. Bemuta abere nga besigwa, ndiba sasa nyamu mawanga. Na ye, bemuli chuka, ne mukoma o jendi, ne muko berela mateka gange, abantu bamwe. Abawanga and Gusibwa, Neweba Sasa and Zibwa, Kunkomedo Yeguru, Ndiba Kunganya, Nebaleta, Mkifo Chenero Ndera, Okube Angamu, Edinia Yange. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. This, this is, is the, the word, word of, of the, the Lord. Lord. For our sermon series, um, if you were here last week, you know that <clears throat> we are doing a very short kind of break in a sermon series where we are processing the pandemic together through scripture. And so what we're doing with that is um, kind of exactly what we're saying there. We're creating a space to process. We're not going to give answers as to what you should feel or hear, what you experience, but this is really kind of the process together. Um, it's to do it together. There's a lot of work that we could be doing individually and we should be doing on our own, kind of going through how we feel about things and our own experiences, but this is, we're at church, and so we're sharing the space together, and so this is really about how we can kind of come to the space together. And then lastly, our lens is really gonna be through scripture. We're gonna be looking at the pandemic and what scripture can teach us. There's a lot of good resources out there that can help us process different things, but our focus really is on scripture for this time period. Um, the passages that we're going to be using is really going to be looking through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So Ezra and Nehemiah are the two books that describe when the people of Israel come back from exile. And the reason we're talking about that is that it feels very similar to our own, sorry, our own context. That in the exile, you had um, the Babylonians conquering Jerusalem, 
uprooting the people of Israel, sending them off to exile into Babylon. Their lives are upended. Everything is changed for 70 years. And then King Cyrus decides, who is a Persian king, decides, no, you can go back. And then everything returns back to normal, right? And I think that that's a kind of a good parallel for us where we are. Because our lives during the pandemic were upended. Everything was changed. We had to change some things that we had never kind of thought about before. And then suddenly, it was just kind of over, right? With even kind of less timeline, less official kind of endpoint uh, than we read in Ezra and Nehemiah, but it just kind of stopped. And now we're kind of back to normal. And so this feels very similar to us. And I think it provides us a context by which we kind of look at where we are and to think about how do we emerge from a similar situation. Last week, what we saw in Ezra chapter 1 is that, um, sorry, Ezra chapter 3 is that the people of Israel or Judah they return back to Jerusalem and they're setting the foundations of the temple. And they're kind of having the celebration to do that because the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Now they can rebuild it. And a great shout goes up, if you remember from Ezra chapter 3. And we'd assume it's just a, sh- a great shout of praise and thanksgiving that they're returning back to normal. Everything is back. But the reality of that moment is that it's a shout of praise and lament and mourning at the same time. That they're so mixed up together, they can't even tell the difference between the two. That as they return back from their exile, there are some very complex and confusing emotions that they feel. They don't feel one way. They feel a whole bunch of ways instead. And I think that's what we confronted last week. That as we emerge from the pandemic, the reality is that we feel a whole lot of different ways. We don't feel one way. And I think part of the way that we process is going to be confronting that that realization that we feel very differently and maybe even kind of contradictory emotions as we come back from the pandemic. And that's not easy for us because we don't like that. It doesn't sit well with us to feel very differently about a single event. But the model that we were learning from last week is the Psalms. Because in the Psalms, what we find is we find confusion, We find one psalmist in one psalm being happy and sad, uh, asking for vengeance upon enemies, but also asking for thanksgiving at the same time, all in one moment. And those psalms give us language and permission to bring complexity to God. That we can feel a whole different lot of ways about the world and about life and the pandemic. And God is big enough for all of it. He's not fragile. You can't knock him off his stool by the intensity of our emotions. And that's something that I think we have to understand. That we might feel all these different ways coming out of these complex moments. God is going to be God afterwards. And so there's a safety when we approach him in those kind of moments that I think we have to kind of understand and realize. So today we're going to continue in that conversation and talking about this time from the book of Nehemiah. But before we did that, I wanted to just refresh our understanding of the exile, where the exile begins. Because we talk, we're going to be talking about them returning from the exile. But let's remember what happened to send them into exile, which comes from 2 Kings 25. 2 Kings 25 describes what's called the siege of Jerusalem. This is what it reads. On the seventh day of the fifth month, in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard, an official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army, under the commander of the imperial guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the commander of the guard, carried into exile the people who remained into the city, along with the rest of the populace and those who had deserted to the king of Babylon. So this is the context that sends them into exile, is this moment. And actually it's bigger than this. This is just a short description of it. There's also a really terrible moment where they take the leaders of, Bab- of, Is- of Judah, sorry, and they actually kind of parade them in front and blind them. And blind them in front of the people of Jerusalem. Just to show them what happens if you resist the king of Babylon. And then after that, after destroying all their buildings, like burning this church to the ground and all the homes and city hall and everything, they pick all all the people and then send them to a foreign land. So that their resources, their work, their everything can be added to the Babylonians' wealth instead. And they also take their wealth, their literal wealth, from that temple and transport it into Babylon. Okay, that's the context. 
And I want us to keep that in mind as we now read from Nehemiah chapter 1. Because in Nehemiah chapter 1, those same people, the people of Judah, are returning back to Jerusalem. And this is what we read. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, Nehemiah, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Okay, so, right, they're sent into exile by the Babylonians, kind of allowed to go back by the Persians. Even as they go back, they're resisted by the Samaritans and by people who are still there. And they are just in a wreck still. They are not doing well. And this is the report that Nehemiah gets. The people have come back, but they're in disgrace. They're in great trouble. There's Persians against them. There's Samaritans against them. They're still suffering how much trauma after seven decades of being in exile from the Babylonians. What would you pray in that moment? What would you be focused on coming back from the Babylonian exile and your people are still kind of disgraced and in trouble in that moment? This is what Nehemiah would pray. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love to those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Now, this might seem like very ordinary biblical language, and oftentimes when we read scripture, we kind of just plow through it and like, yeah, that sounds biblical, that sounds right. right. But just for a moment, really think about this. That in a moment where Nehemiah could have placed blame on the Babylonians or the Persians or the Samaritans, Nehemiah focuses on the people of Judah and himself. What would be more natural in this moment when they return from the exile than to say, those Babylonians, that's why we're here. May they be cursed for all their generations. And the Persians resist us. They demand tribute even after they have released us. Don't they know what they have done? And the Samaritans, Our own people, our own flesh and blood, who are no longer our flesh and blood, they're the ones who are standing up against. You would think that the first prayer that me and Nehemiah would pray after the exile would be vindictive. It would be kind of curses and blaming and just saying, it's because of all these people that we are suffering, that we are in disgrace and trouble in this moment. But instead, no. His focus is exclusively on the people of Israel, on himself, on his own family instead when he could have been blaming other people. This is not the only moment, because even when they share this moment together, it's not just Nehemiah, but in Nehemiah chapter 9, the people of, of, of Judah do this together, and it says this. You warned them in order to turn them back to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, of which you said, the person who obeys them will live by them. Stubbornly, they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked, and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them. By your spirit you warned them through your prophets. Yet they paid no attention. So you gave them into the hands of the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy you did not put an end to them or abandon them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. And so even for the people of Israel they return. And they could easily put them in thinking about all those people who had wronged them. And they were genuinely wronged. But instead their focus is on themselves their own attitudes, their own actions, what they should have been doing instead. And I think this might be a real challenge for us to be considering in this time. That as we emerge from the pandemic, perhaps our focus should be less on others and more on ourselves. That as we return from our own exile and we think about what happened, again, the tendency, the temptation would be those people and that person, that group, that leader, But instead, like the people of Israel, maybe we should be looking in the mirror instead. This is not going to be easy for us. And the reason why it's going to be especially difficult right now is that we have all endured and participated in what I'll call a long cultural season of externalization. What I mean by that is that 
throughout the entire pandemic and really preceding it, we've all got into a very bad habit. And that is that the moment we get into a room, we're looking at other people and we're making quick judgments about what those kind of people are. We've all been doing this. And kind of we had to do it when there's a medical emergency and we can get sick from other people. But we all began to develop this attitude where you walk in a room and you can immediately tell. You're automatically looking, who's my people? Who believes the same things that I believe? Are you wearing a mask or are you not wearing a mask? What kind of flag do you fly in your front yard? What kind of bumper sticker do you have? What kind of banner do you fly? We immediately became so externally focused that whenever we go onto a bus or a school or in the workplace, we go online, we are constantly thinking about the people around us. We've done this now for years. We did that all throughout the pandemic, so that's three years straight. But even for the pandemic, we had some other really big events that were going on before then. Presidential campaigns, administrations that what had happened. And so at all that time period, we began to develop this very kind of strong pulse where we're looking at other people and judging, what kind of person are you? Do you believe the same things that I believe? Or are you one of those kind of people instead? And I don't think any of us are exempt from this. I think as a culture, as a nation, we have all got into this deep rut We're so externally focused on other people and the wrong that they're doing and how they're messing this up and you're making this go longer. You're making this worse. You are the problem. How many blog posts did we read like that? How many articles did we read? How many times did we hear this over and over and as we resisted it, we became it? And I'm looking at myself as well. That for three years, I could sense it in my own soul. This sense of looking at people and saying, oh, you believe that? You do that, you dress this way, or you do that instead. We've all developed this tendency of externalizing and constantly looking out to other people. And my challenge to us is this, that although we did engage in a long season focused on others, it's time for us to look into ourselves and our own attitudes and actions. It's time for us to turn away from that. It's time for us to break free from that. Yes, we have all been victimized and participating in this cultural season of looking and externalizing and blaming all the time. But it's time for us to break free from it. And it's time for us to look into ourselves instead. This is not going to be easy. And so a few encouragements as we begin in that process. The first thing for us to remember is this. Looking first to our own attitudes and actions is a consistent biblical calling. It's what we're told in Scripture. For example, in Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, um, it begins kind of with a, a pandemic attitude and says this. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from you, me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you, God, with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. So in this, we have, this, is, this kind of fits us. We like this. This sounds kind of familiar. Like those people, right? They made this longer. That country did this. That kind of political group, they did this. God, you must hate them for what they're doing. This is familiar territory for all of us. But this is not the final word in Psalm 139, if you know it. Because on a dime, it turns and it says this. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need to make this same turn. Yeah, maybe a lot of us, myself included, we did participate in this kind of cultural season of kind of looking and and seeing what kind of people are. But we need to turn now, like in Psalm 21, in verse 23, and say, what did I do? What could I have done better? What did I do right? What are my own attitudes in this moment? In the same way as we read in Psalm 139. Or another moment where we see this calling to know ourselves is in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus himself teaches this, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This should collectively send a chill up our spines. Because we have spent years now judging each other harshly, 
And the fact that Jesus says, when you do that, you're going to be judged harshly. That's not a good word for us right now. But he continues on and says this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all the time there is a plank in your eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is our biblical calling. Our biblical calling is not to judge. We are not judges. That's not our identity. That's not who we are. Judging is for God alone. And this is something that we need to reclaim for ourselves from Scripture. We are not and have never been judges. And I think that's something that we need to remind ourselves from by the Bible. That should be enough for us as Bible people, but it's usually not. So maybe just a couple of other things that I think introspection can do for us. Another thing that it helps us do is to remember that understanding our own attitudes and actions provides focus and clarity. One of the hard things about the pandemic was it was so confusing. We had medical things that none of us knew. Like within one week, we're like all epidemiologists and, you know, people who, who know everything about diseases and we're telling other people, no, you don't understand diseases like I do, right? <laughs> so there's the medical part of it. There's like the political things that were happening. There's like the social anthropological things that are going on. There's family tensions that we feel. There are things that are happening in our community and within our churches. And when we try to process that, it's like processing under a waterfall. You can't think about it all. It's just too overwhelming. The thing that introspection does gives you one thing to think about. And it's just you. It's just me. Yeah, there's so many other things that were going on. But just for right now, what about me? What did I do? What could I have done? What did I do wrong? What did I do right? It gives us clarity and focus in a context where we have very little of it. And that can be really powerful. Another thing that introspection can do for us is that understanding our own attitudes and actions does not mean that others do not bear responsibility, just that their responsibility is not ours to bear. It sounds complicated like some kind of Zen thing I'm saying, but let me just explain this. One thing that I think stops me from interest in being more introspective is that I don't want to let other people off the hook. And I feel like once I look into myself, that means I'm letting that other party off the hook. Yeah, yeah, I, I think about myself, but they did something wrong. They're the real cause of it. And so I have to make sure that my lens is outward, thinking about that other person because they did something wrong. And that oftentimes that's what stops us from really engaging in a season of thinking about ourselves is we don't want to let other people off the hook in the process of looking in the mirror. The question is, if we look in the mirror, does that necessarily mean that someone else has done nothing wrong? It doesn't. There's no logical reason that's true. Just because we're trying to understand ourselves better doesn't mean that other people bear no responsibility. It just means that's not our responsibility to bear it. Even when Jesus talks about this, when he encourages people and he commands them, sorry, not to judge, what does he say in that whole speck and log thing? He says, you're a hypocrite. Why are you paying attention to this, the, the speck in someone else's eye while you have a log in your own? Take out the log in your own so that you can do what? If you remember back. So you can clear the speck in someone else's eye. It doesn't say, you're the only bad person in the world. There are no specks to go around. Even in that passage, he implies there's plenty of blame. Everyone can be doing something better. But the only better that you have to be responsible for is your own. Is your own. And so I hope for some of us who have been genuinely wronged and hurt, realize that you can look into yourself and it doesn't mean that other person is blame free. You are not absolving them. All you're doing is taking responsibility for the only thing you can be responsible for. One more thing that I think introspection does for us is this. Understanding our own attitudes and actions is important because ultimately, that is the only thing we have control over. It's the only thing we have control over. Like I said, it's been such a complex season with so many different kind of influences and you know, medical things and political things and social things that were going on. When it comes down to it, we had control over none of it. We didn't have control over how a virus changes, right? We don't have control over governments and the determinations that they make. We don't have control over the person next to you and what they think about you. 
We have no control over what happens when you walk in a restaurant and you're wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. We have no control over those things. There's only one thing in this entire period that we have control over. That's ourselves. Our own actions, our attitudes. And sometimes I think we think that we were just kind of people were manipulating us. We had no control. It was the only thing we had control over during this time is what we could have done. And that's what introspection does. It helps us to remember that. It helps us to remember that this is the only thing that we can do, control, is really ourselves. And that moment of introspection brings that back for us and helps us to refocus on that one truth. That, that is the only thing that we control, is what we do and our own actions on our own responses instead. I hope that this gives us kind of uh, um, some motivation to stop, to stop flowing with the flow of culture right now of being people who are judgmental and externalizing and constantly looking to our neighbors to see what they're doing wrong. To stop as we see that stop in Psalm 139 and say, you know what? Search me, God, and know me. Search me and know me instead. There's any wayward way within me. And lead me instead in a way that's everlasting. It's one thing to kind of want to do that. It's another thing to actually begin to do that and to begin the practice of introspection. So what I wanted to do is actually invite someone to lead us in a time to do that. So we're not just motivated, but we actually get some tools to do that. And so I'm going to ask Pastor Van, who is one of our appointed pastors, but also spiritual director, who really kind of specializes in helping people kind of know their interior spiritual spaces to kind of lead us in the exercise of introspection. So she'll be doing that for us. So we can kind of put this into practice right away. Okay. Yay, technology. Hi, my name is Van. I'm so glad to be here with you all. I will be leading you in a time of reflection, so I will not repeat all the things he said, even though I want to. Um, I like too much information, and that's not good. But hopefully I will give you enough time to, again, to reflect. And if my voice help you to get closer to God, feel free to use that. But in the time of silence, if God is taking you to places, then may my voice just be white noise. So Lord, please take control. And here we go. So I just want you to take a moment to settle, to take a deep breath, get comfortable, like a rock settling on the bottom of a lake after it's thrown in, let yourself settle. Now I invite you, it's always an invitation, I invite you to close your eyes so that you can allow your other senses to increase. So in settling, go ahead and acknowledge how you are feeling in this moment. If being calm is hard, acknowledge that. If you find yourself frustrated or stressed, Acknowledge that. God wants to be present in all parts of our lives, not just the easy or serene moments. So as we begin our prayer, become aware of God's presence right now in this moment. Letting go of all that has come before and focusing on right now. God is with us. God is with you. See God's loving gaze upon you as you gaze upon God. And if an arm is better, feel God's embrace. Now I want you to ask God for light and insight as we prepare to review our lives during the pandemic, beginning in 2020, to this current time. So take a moment to think about how COVID has impacted your life. Invite God to be with you as you look back the past three years. I wonder when you heard and began to understand the magnitude of the corona, coronavirus, were you like, you know, were you like Naaman? Did your body sink? Did you weep and mourn? 
Did you fast or petition? Were you angry? Act out in frustration, give in to fear, disconnect since we are encouraged to social distance. Did you continue to seek out distraction like entertainment to relieve stress instead of going to God? Did you post unkind message on social media because it was anonymous? Were you also guilty of doing what you don't want to do, doing the very thing that you hate? Did any of these moments lead to a decrease of your faith, hope, or love? Pause to acknowledge those moments. If you need to confess, do so to our loving God. If you need to seek forgiveness, do so. Our gracious God is ready to hear and forgive our sins. In humility, we can ask God for help, ask God to bless us, to give vision to the impossible that only God can make possible. Now let's continue to be present with God. You might imagine yourself sitting with Jesus and talking, or even viewing a video of your life over the past three years going all the way back to 2020, giving Jesus the remote and asking him to show you, to hit the pause button to remember. What were those moments like? Were you proud of those moments? Were the situation you were in out of your control? Were there temptation to take control, to be God instead of asking God? Were there moments you made things worse? Were there moments you blame others instead of focusing on yourself? What people experiences disappointment and other moments left you feeling less hopeful, more isolated, and less connected to others and to God? Take a moment to look back. Was there a person or a group of people, especially affected by COVID-19, that you didn't often choose to see? Are they there people you blame for coronavirus? How about the people that make things worse? Did you give into fear? Are, you, are there people you choose to judge instead of love? Do you normally choose to reach out and to connect, who do you avoid or refuse to see? If you can, go ahead and picture the faces of those people. What connection do you see or that you take for granted in your life? Note the emotion you feel when you think of these individuals without judging or overanalyzing, simply acknowledging them, pay attention, Listen to where God may be speaking. As you think of the ways we are connected or disconnected to one another, pick a connection or lack thereof that seems important, significant, or is manifesting itself the strongest. Pause and reflect where you're being invited to grow from that moment. Take a moment to pray on it. Are there more personal confessions? Who do you need to confess your wrongs and apologize to? When we pray in humility, we are able to acknowledge that we need God, that we completely depend on God, and in our needs, we are able to identify with others who are in need, to connect, find similarity, 
versus distancing and blaming. Humility allowed Nehemiah to plainly and simply confess to sin without any attempt at excusing the sin. He did so corporately and personally. So we just took time for personal confession. Is there anything you need and want to confess corporately? Are there any of the ism you need to confess to? Like racism, sexism, ageism. Were there times you feel division instead of unity, destruction versus seeking restoration? Go ahead and take a moment to allow Jesus to show you. Of the moments you have reflected on, is there anything you need to ask forgiveness for? Go ahead and ask God for forgiveness. If you need to ask for wisdom and guidance on whether or not to seek action, please do so now. Prayer give us strength when we wait on the Lord in prayer. We will renew our strength. He will renew our strength. So let's look ahead to the future. Do you sense any invitation from God as you move forward? Is God inviting you to make a change, commit more fully to something after this experience of the pandemic? Are there any habits, viewpoint, understanding you made during the pandemic that you want to change? Ask God for whatever help you. Notice God's invitation. Lord, hear our prayer. Help us to be more like you, to love like you, to offer grace like you. Help us to expand our compassion to the sides of Lake Washington. Oh, Holy One, thank you for journeying with us. Thank you that we don't have to do this alone. We can be on this journey with you, our loved ones and community. May your will be done. Amen. <laughs>